Well, thank you all for attending our session today. Before we get started, we wanted to just get a quick poll to see who is here. So if you are any of the following, please raise your hand. And if we miss you, you can let us know what, what your area you're in. So first, um, who here are trainees in some sort of case, some fellows here? All right. Um, welcome. Pharmacists? OK. Awesome. OK, great. Um, nurses, IPs? Awesome. OK, and physicians? Great, thank you. <laughs> and then um, next is what uh, practice setting you're in. So um, if you're in acute care hospital, raise your hand. All right, long-term care facility. Okay, and then outpatient clinic. Okay, any that we have missed? Awesome, thank you. And Mike? State public health. Okay, public health and microbiology. Yes, okay. LTAC, yeah, LTAC. Okay, great. Thank you. This helps us kind of give a feel for who our audience is and, you know, kind of speak to the areas we're covering. All right, I'm already down a minute or two. So, first, I'm going to be talking about antibiotic myth number one, and that's history of penicillin allergies means no beta lactams. Hope to dispel this myth for you shortly. This is my disclosure. Our case is a 62-year-old female who found a lump in her right breast. She's about to undergo a lumpectomy um, for what is found to be breast cancer. Um, she, her surgical site um, infection prophylaxis normally should be cefazolin, but she reports a penicillin allergy, um, and this has occurred in childhood. Reaction was a rash. So, Alternative often is maybe clindamycin. So um, what's the best next step for her? Often we think, oh, well, I'm just going to play it safe and avoid a penicillin and all beta-lactams. Like, let's give her the clindamycin. And what I'd like to share is that that's probably um, the going to cause worse outcomes is not the preferred therapy for her. Okay, so um, just some facts about penicillin allergy. We know there's a lot of people that report penicillin allergies. About 10% of the population will tell you that. Um, however, very few of them actually turn out to have a penicillin allergy when they are tested. Um, so just some additional information. By the way, we all have too many slides to share, so we're not going to go through them all, but these are just some for reference um, for later. So just 80% um, of those who have a penicillin IgE mediated penicillin allergy, so they did have a true allergy, they will outgrow them later. And um, a lot of people say, oh, I have family history of penicillin allergy. I can't have any penicillins. Another myth. Um, so, additional facts, I'm not going to run through all of these, but suffice to say there are many harms that are associated with beta-lactam allergies um, in that, I should say, falsely or um, incorrectly reported beta-lactam allergies. So um, when patients report these and they are not truly um, identified or uh, corrected, you can see longer length of stay in the hospital, higher mortality. Um, both in the 30-day period and all of the way up to 180 days post. 30-day um, uh, readmission rates are increased amongst these patients. Higher C. diff, which is not surprising if you think about clindamycin use instead of that cefazolin. Um, increased hospital charges and um, use of additional antibiotic classes. So what do we do with these patients? Um, you know, somebody who reports a penicillin allergy in childhood, there's a lot we can do. You shouldn't, st you shouldn't just stop there. So first is taking a history. So first of all, if they didn't know when that was, um, ask them, like, oh, was this, you know, 20 years ago? And, and you know, pe patients in their six, you know, sixth or seventh decade um, of penicillin allergy reported, that young in their childhood is probably um, not as relevant anymore. Um, did they, and then a lot of people say, I had a penicillin allergy, um, but you ask them, have you had amoxicillin before? Or have you had augmentin before? And it turns out they're like, yeah, yeah, I've had that. And they're like, okay, we, we, you, we can just take that out of your chart. Like, we don't need to um, perpetuate and keep that in there. Um, now, there is a lot more evidence for going straight for a oral drug challenge. I'm going to share with you a trial um, that kind of helps us uh, proceed with that a little bit more easily. And then for those that we're just uncertain about, there is skin testing. Um, a lot of people have implemented this within their either clinic setting or acute care um, setting, um, but a lot of them have to be referred to allergy if you don't have the um, tools and the access to the penicillin skin testing. Um, and then 
Let's get to that pesky EMR alert that pops up when you say penicillin allergy, you cannot have a cephalosporin. Like, you know, n n uh, this is being perpetuated by our own EMR. So um, pen there is very little cross-reactivity between the beta-lactam classes. Um, so between our penicillins, cephalosporins, and carbapenems. And then if you go further and someone says there is cephalosporin allergy, um, there's a lot more, there's a lot of cephalosporins that we can try to um, get a little bit more specific so um, we can find out what other cephalosporins they may actually be able to have. So one thing to note is that it's not really related to what um, the name of the cephalosporin or kind of even there's some degree of relationship uh, between the classes, but it's really about this R1 side chain. And so that's highlighted there on the left. Um, and, and the interesting thing about cefazolin, so if we're talking about surgical site infection in, per, in particular, um, cefazolin has a very unique side chain and that there's no relationship with other beta-lactam classes. So even if that patient does truly have a penicillin allergy or an allergy to say ceftriaxone, it is perfectly fine to give um, cefazolin to that patient. Um, another, and then this is a, on the right is a graph, um, this is on our stewardship website, that goes through what relationship that R1 side chain has, if there's any react cross-reactivity with those other cephalosporins, so, or, or other beta-lactams as well. So you can see if they're red, that means that's a strong um, similarity in that R1 side chain, so you should not use that if, the, if a patient's reporting that allergy. Um, but if they're yellow, it's kind of like a proceed with caution. But if it's not highlighted at all, then that's perfectly reasonable to try um, challenging that patient with that antibiotic. So this is a really helpful tool, especially to share with clinicians who may be a little skeptical. And then this is a PenFast tool. This is a externally validated um, tool developed uh, by colleagues internationally in Australia. Um, and it has been also validated in immunocompromised patients because I feel that is a population that often is given the like, oh, I'm not really sure what to do with this group. Um, but you can use this as well in that, in that population. So this is just a really easy history taking tool. And um, you can see the first one is, uh, so you use it if they're reporting a penicillin allergy. Um, the first question is, how, when was that? Was it five years or less since the reaction? Um, did they have a report an anaphylaxis uh, to, um, as their reaction or angioedema? Um, the S stands for severe cutaneous adverse reaction, so something like Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Um, and then T, did they require treatment for that allergic reaction? Um, you can see the points are assigned for each of those questions. And if they are scoring two or less, they're considered at low risk for a penicillin allergy. Um, if they have zero, I mean, that's, we're seeing a very low risk. You can probably proceed with an oral challenge. So um, there was a study that examined this particular group, so those that were low risk for penicillin allergies, and randomized them to receive an oral challenge with penicillin. Um, and they randomized either to oral penicillin challenge or skin testing, which is kind of the prior uh, standard of care. And the primary outcome was a positive penicillin um, allergy, or, and that was uh, as um, defined there. Ultimately, uh, there was no difference between the groups and findings, um, so no delayed immune reaction. Um, penicillin allergy was removed in uh, the vast majority of both the control and the intervention group. 94% um, of those did have a PenFast score of less than two, so these were the very low risk or a score of one. Um, so takeaways from this is, you know, we can try to, we can skip through that skin testing, which is can be really difficult and a lot of, um, could be resource intensive. Um, the nice thing, you can do this in any setting, whether it's clinic, um, outpatient, uh, long-term care facility, or inpatient. Um, it's less expensive, less labor intensive. So my takeaways, delabel those antibiotic allergies when you see them, ask about what they are and address them because you're really giving that patient optimal care. Um, surgical site infection prophylaxis is a good um, area to start with and then um, use the oral challenge, um, and you can use that PenFast score, which is really simple and quick. All right. Time is up.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is a good uh, exercise for us how to, uh, we, we each have about 25 slides. We were told when we came, we only have eight minutes for a presentation. <laughs> so I feel like I'm, I'm retaking the board. So you have a limited num number of, of time for a question, otherwise we will fail. So, uh, so let, let's start with the show. We are talking about antibiotic myths. So I will be talking about UTI, asymptomatic bacteria, and that's probably something you very frequently see in the, in the hospital. So does bacteria in the urine signify the UTI? Who thinks yes? Good. I already feel it. I think I can just go through this and go to the last slide. <laughs> so, case study. Healthy woman in her 50s, uh, breaks her hip, comes to the hospital, okay, no medical problems, and obviously gets a procedure done. Um, and this happens not just at, at our hospital, in other hospitals, when people come to the ED, as part of the workup, no matter why you are there, they will order urine analysis. Well, why do you do that? You were taught in medical school, in nursing school, ask the patient, do you have hesitancy, urgency, frequency? Or are you in la-la land? Are you, are you encephalopathic? Because those will be the indications to do an investigation. Otherwise, if the refuse system is negative, you, don't, you shouldn't do a UA. Well, I guess what happened? Uh, there is the cup, the patient provided the sample, and then it was processed, uh, and the urine analysis, you will see on the next slide. So, who thinks, based on this, that this is a UTI? This is a UTI which should be treated. Patient has no symptoms of a urinary tract infection, and here you see urine analysis with, 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 with some pyuria, um, you, see, uh, you see bacteria, you don't see squamous cells. So based on that, raise your hands. Who would treat this person for a UTI? If there is one hand up, I will come and push it down. <laughs> good. That's very good. That means that you are using your judgment, and the patient is the best source of information. No matter where you are and who you are, you know, you always have to ask the patient, do they have any symptoms? If they don't, you are even legally protected. If a lawyer looks at it and you, he, maybe somebody wants to have a case that maybe, maybe there was something missed, if the review of systems goes against symptoms of, of a UTI, you are covered, okay? Klebsiella pneumonia was recovered. Uh, there is the plate. And look at the antibiotic choices. This is a pan-sensitive Klebsiella pneumonia uh, uh, positive urine culture. So what happens next? Uh, the patient was diagnosed uh, with a UTI based on the urine analysis and urine culture, whether it was right or wrong, and you will see uh, how wrong this was because there were some serious, uh, uh, serious um, uh, uh, sequelae. Levofloxacin. If she had a UTI, who would have picked levofloxacin to treat this? Well, I will make it easy. It's a pen sensitive, so anything would work. But if she has no allergies, you can use a cephalosporin, you can use nitroforantuin. Levofloxacin is not the vitamin L that you can use for everything. So based on the susceptibilities, if the patient meets the criteria, you choose the right antibiotic. So, and then as time went by, she was treated with levoquin, then she was, um, and she developed symptoms, you know, and look at these symptoms. Belly pain, fevers, chills, and take a look at uh, what the CAT scan, re I didn't, uh, didn't uh, bring you the study, but there was colitis seen on the, on the CT scan. And the testing for CD was positive. The patient was not on probiotics. Many in this room do not believe in probiotics. I know there are not significant uh, um, robust studies to support probiotics. I put all my patients on, on probiotics. I really don't see uh, too, much, um, uh, uh, too much C. diff because they will ma hopefully maintain the balance in the GI tract. Patient was started on the treatment uh, for C. diff. You all in the room know which are the choices. You have metronidazole, which is not the preferred choice anymore. You have vancomycin and fluvoxomycin. Uh, patient gets worse, decompensates, more belly pain, and worsening leukocytosis, acute renal failure, and what does she need? She needs to go to the OR and the colon has to be removed. She became really ill. Based on just some maybe um, poor clinical choices uh, as far as treatment of her, of her infection. So bad, bad outcome, and that's why we are talking about this. We would like to avoid similar situations. Who has seen a case like that? So. It's not infrequent, it's not like one in a million, like when, how often do you see malaria, once a year? No, this is something you see, unfortunately, quite 
quite frequently. So the histopathology is on the slide. Um, could this outcome be avoided? Yes. How? We will talk about this. And, you know, overutilization of cultures. This is a common problem, and it's all over our healthcare continuum. Doesn't matter if it's a university hospital, also not a Nebraska medicine, but, you know, it depends what kind of stewardship you have. It depends who is in charge of the micro lab. And even though, you know, I think the key to this is education. You know, if you don't have the buy-in of the stakeholders who work in a certain institution. That's the only way to, to make a change. You need to educate them. Maybe you need to scare them with a case like this. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe they, we all can, uh, you know, teach each other and learn a lesson from each other and make some changes in our uh, patient care. So, um, effects on the, on, on, on the uh, uh, inappropriate urine cultures. Um, there is significant uh, wasting of the, of, of the lab resources. Um, you know, positive urine culture uh, will, uh, will encourage unnecessary antibiotic use. You know, uh, there are certain screenings which some people do for UTIs which are unnecessary. And if you have, uh, if you have uh, used inappropriate antibiotics, you have up to 8.5-fold uh, increase of development of C. diff. Okay. Does this patient meet the criteria for a UTI? We already talked about this. So she has some symptoms in the, in, in the lab but uh, and she has some features in the laboratory, but what is lacking are the symptoms. You all know this, we can skip that. Um, you know, there is um, upper and lower UTI uh, symptoms. For the sake of time, I will have to move on. Uh, this is important. You all know about asymptomatic bacteria. There are guidelines for that. So if there is, a, um, if there is a, um, uh, more than 100,000 colony forming units, you know, in your, in, in, your, in your urine culture without an inverting catheter that meets the criteria of asymptomatic bacteria. Asymptomatic bacteria does not mean a UTI. Um, the guidelines of our ID society from 2005 and updated uh, in 2019, the difference is that in 20, uh, 2005, we only uh, uh, put the pregnant women and uh, uh, people undergoing uh, GU surgeries as far as who has to be treated for asymptomatic bacteria Later on, some of these other categories have been added. Okay, can you separate asymptomatic bacteria from, from a UTI? You really cannot. You know, you have pyuria, you have bacteria, but you still need the symptoms. If you don't have the symptoms, it's not a UTI. There are some ex exceptions. People who are working in long-term facilities will know that there are some elderly, um, elderly patients who can be encephalopathic, and then you need to be looking for potential sources, and UTI could be one of them. When the, when the elderly get acutely confused, it's the same thing that you were taught in medical school. Dehydration, medications, infection. Stroke may become next, but dehydration, medication, infection. Okay. Um, we already kind of talked about this. Contaminated specimens are very, very common. Contaminated specimens should be distinguished from a, from, from a specimen which is valid and you know, the, the, the review of systems, the patient's symptoms are really leading your decision to treat or not. Um, okay, I have one more minute, right? Okay, okay. So, goals, goals for, a, for a UTI diagnosis. We already kind of went through this. It's really important to follow the CDC guidelines wherever you are, but you can stand in your head and mention the, the the, the CDC guidelines to your colleagues, to your peers, in an infection control forum, wherever. You need to explain it, why they, are, they have to be applied. And really sometimes you have, to, uh, you have to document that some inappropriate antibiotic choices, uh, choices and you know, antibiotic consumption can result into something like that. This is what we did at our hospital. We looked back at charts of um, urine analysis in cultures actually collected in, in the emergency room, and we collected this information, went to the appropriate stakeholders, and now the chief medical officer actually published a statement how this can be changed. So only, only people with symptoms, uh, um, the urine should be collected for possible investigation and uh, institution of antibiotics. So use your judgment. Limit the use of antibiotics uh, because they can have some untoward effects. C. diff is not one of them. They can co cause collateral damage. You know, they can cause MDROs and so on and so on. Remember, up to 40% of uh, antibiotics in the United States are used inappropriately and unnecessarily. So that's the message. 
uh, from the uh, former CDC chairman, Dr. Friedlander, I believe, uh, Fried, something like that. So thank you very much for your attentions. Dave, vein versus pill antibiotic. Okay. Boom. Yes, there's off-label stuff because nothing's indicated for ortho infections. All right. Actual case, 70-year-old dude. Um, he had a left ear issue. It was progressive. There was drainage from the ear. Uh, controlled the diabetic. He has a bioprosthetic aortic valve. Mastoiditis. There was some temporal bone involvement. No CNS um, involvement, anything like that. Um, he grew pneumococcus, it was pan-susceptible, blood cultures were clear because he had bony infection. He was dismissed from the hospital on ceftriaxone daily with a plan for six weeks of treatment for osteomyelitis. Okay. Day 35 of treatment, he had feet, he had malaise, fevers developed the next day. Uh, then he saw his doc, they said, huh, maybe a line issue, whatever. They took out his line, uh, said, eh, yeah, close enough for the bone, that's fine. Um, blood cultures turned positive for Canada albicans in a guy with a bioprosthetic valve because he had a line in. Okay. So that was the actual case. Um, his heart was not involved, but it could have been. Uh, Long-term antibiotics, we know that certain infections require longer-term therapy. For some of these, orals generally felt to be appropriate, like a lung abscess, frequently treated with pills, liver abscess, frequently treated with pills, that type of things. For others, the general gestalt is you're using IV treatment. Um, the most common ones there are uh, bacteremias, endocarditis, bone infections, uh, brain infections. Actual data for these. Okay, cool. First, history. Where did the four to six weeks of IV treatment for osteo come from? There you go. An uncontrolled case series in 1970, that's before even I was born, um, patients received either IV penicillin or aminoglycoside. There was no oral therapy arm or anything like that. So the conclusion of that, and the patients did well. So the conclusion of that study was, hey, if you're treating osteomyelitis and you give them surgery and you give them prolonged uh, parenteral antibiotic therapy, they do well. Okay, that is a fine conclusion, but that doesn't mean that's the only thing that you can do. Um, but since that, it has gone through. For endocarditis, the case series started in the 1940s and 50s, and it compared IV penicillin to oral sulfonilamide, erythromycin, or tetracycline none of which would actually be very beneficial for a bacteremia, um, but they were available at the time, so they were studied. So IV was superior to PO when you're using cruddy PO drugs. Okay. Um, this is intentionally small, so you can look at later, but I like Fisher plots because you can blow through your slide quickly. This is nice published things of comparing oral versus venous for um, bone infections. Nary a one of those does not cross the line. Okay, uh, non-inferior. How about bacteremia? Ooh, one of them doesn't have the line. Yeah, that favors on the oral end. So there you go. Um, now with any of these that are retrospective, you can have biases in there because maybe people who looked healthier got on pills or that kind of stuff. But they're not all CRUD studies, okay? A lot of them are actually prospective, going forward, looking forward studies. And whenever it's actually been studied, no difference between vein versus pill other than doc comfort level. Uh, for the endocarditis studies, uh, these are prospective and actually favoring oral. Why would you actually favor oral? Well, you have less complications. You don't have this big honking tube sticking out your arm, direct connection between the outside world and your blood. You're not gonna be getting a blood clot. There are some caveats with that um, that I'll mention in a minute. So of the 21 published studies in the meta-analysis I uh, scarfed these Fisher plots from, uh, 20 were actually prospective randomized trials for those indications. One was a quasi-experimental pre-post. That was, what I mean by that is there was a place who changed their practice, they compared their befores to their afters. So it wasn't like randomized, it was a point in time comparing before and after. Of those 21 studies, 21 out of 21 showed that oral was at least as effective as parenteral, and zero out of 21 showed better outcomes 
uh, with parenteral treatment. Okay, mm -hmm. eh, I don't know the p-value of that, but there you go. Um, that brings us to this, cognitive dissonance. So you have, say, a prosthetic knee infection with Staph aureus. A very frequent treatment plan is somebody will be placed on rifampin, and they will be placed on cefazolin. The cefazolin dose will be 2 grams Q8 hours, and the rifampin will be 600 milligrams uh, daily, or 300 BID, or 150, whatever. Okay, people use all different rifampin doses. But the providers are okay with the rifampin by pill, but not the cefazolin by pill. So why are they okay with some meds by pill and some meds not by pill? And if you ask people that, um, first of all, they look at you funny, but the second thing is they will often come up with, well, uh, bioavailability. You get really good levels of uh, rifampin and you don't necessarily get good levels with other antibiotics. Okay, that's great. So what is the actual bioavailability of these? Rifampin is not as good as cephalexin. Okay, so, I mean, it's not bad. That's a pretty stinking good bioavailability, 70 to 93%. Um, it varies depending on what study and how long they're on it because it induces its own metabolism and then you get different levels. But these medications actually have very good bioavailability. So these are nice alternatives if you're going to be considering oral medications. Not all moral oral medications are equal. For example, like uh, ceftonir, something like that, 30-40% bioavailability would not be my drug of choice, okay? Um, vancomycin, less than 0.5% bioavailability. I've actually seen people treated with cellulitis with PO vanco, and surprisingly, they didn't do well. Okay, the drug's <laughs> got to be absorbed. Okay, all right. So the caveats for um, using oral treatment is... People with acute septic physiology, absorption is not well studied, so parenteral is probably indicated there. There have been clinical failures that are observed with transition to oral treatment prior to day three of treatment in critically ill people. So you got somebody in the ICU on pressors, probably don't want them on a Keflex pill. Okay. Um, their gut has to work. So for example, if they are somebody like his poor patient who just had their colon taken out and they have a big ileus, Probably don't want to use their guts, okay? You actually have to have an effective oral agent. All right, if you got a quinolone-resistant pseudomonas, good luck to you, you're not using a pill. Um, and you have to use an appropriate dose. If you have somebody and you have them on cephalexin 500 milligrams once a day, they gonna fail, okay? It ain't the drug that failed, it's you that failed the patient. Um, and the patient still needs to be monitored for adverse reactions, like linazolid. We all know that linazolid can cause low uh, platelet counts or whatever. But so you monitor for that. It's considered, oh no, we have to monitor their labs once a week or twice a week if they're on linazolid. That's routine if they're on IV treatment, but it's a problem if they're on linazolid. That's that cognitive dissonance thing again. Case two, I had this dude, 72 year old guy, right prosthetic knee infection. For some reason he had Bayonella in there, one stage knee replacement. I actually talked to him in the hospital on post-op day two. He said, yo, dude, give me the pill, okay? So I treat him with high-dose amoxiclav. That's actually, a, instead of using 1,000 milligrams four times a day, because that type of dose was used in POET trial for endocarditis, a little lower because he was old, did great. One case doesn't prove anything, but dude does fine. That's all I got. <laughs> Question. And I have a comment on Dr. Kotula's, why they check the urine in the confused patient. You know, they check the urine because it's there. They could just as easily check the spinal fluid, but it's a lot harder. <laughs> I read that somewhere, I don't know where. So when the elderly gets confused, look for other clues. 
There must be some low grade temperature. There must be some suprapubic pain. And it takes a long time to extract this, just like when I see these nursing home patients. So they, there is usually some other additional symptom. If nothing else, order a CBC. Typically, you know, yes, there can be always exceptions to the rule. But don't just take these calls from a nursing home. The patient smells, you know, uh, or actually the urine smells. Maybe the patient smells that needs to be watched, uh, washed. Because then the next step is somebody orders a UA, you know, or there's a urine couch, so they get CPRO for 10 days. So there is usually some other clue, which is, as one more time, somewhat difficult to extract, but do the best you can. That's all we can do in medicine. I just want to add one more thing. Um, I've, and there's a lot of great resources now about educating residents and families about proper, um, you know, ASB versus UTI and treatment. And a lot of, like all of you here today know this, but a lot of your staff, or there's a lot of turnover, and so you, it's retraining all the time. So there are some great online resources nowadays. So I would just encourage you to disseminate those as part of a continual QI process going on. One other thing with that, and this takes some serious history delving, and you have to have data available. Because if somebody's in like a long-term facility, this is often a labyrinth repeat happens over and over. And at least once along the way, you know the empiric antibiotic they got would not have killed what eventually grew on the culture. So you can point to that time, oh look, um, Martha in March, she was confused, they check her urine, they started an antibiotic, and she actually got better even though the antibiotic didn't kill what was there. So data point, they watered her because she was dry and she got better. Okay, dehydration's a real thing. That's not me being sarcastic or making fun of people. Uh, I am a sarcastic dude, but not in this case. Um, but you can actually, if you look hard, often find data points like that where, look, she wasn't actually effectively treated and she got better. In this case, I know it was in the urine. Could it be the urine sometimes? Sure, but it's not always the, the urine. And when I'm in the hospital, um, and I see people like the family at the bedside and they say that the emergency department said they have a like urine infection or something. I say, you know, I think there's a Nebraska statute that says you can't make it through the emergency room without being diagnosed with a UTI. <laughs> I think the problem is the bright red leg. <laughs>